G'day ladies and gents, and welcome back to War Thunder, and welcome to something that is, again, a little bit different. This is the P47D16RE in the German tech tree. This is the new premium Thunderbolt, well, I say new, but it's newer than the other Thunderbolt, which I believe is the D27. The P47D16 is a Razorback Thunderbolt, and is one of the planes that uh, Gaijin introduced when they introduced the Razorback series in order to correct a historical inaccuracy. The Germans actually flew this thing in a squadron. I believe they flew a whole squadron of captured planes including P-38s, I believe there was a Spitfire and of course this thing here, the P-47. Now the P-47 in the German tree is in a bit of an interesting spot. You see the German tree consists of fairly sort of hybrid type fighters. BF 109s, Focke-Wulf 190s, and the occasional heavy fighter. Now, this particular plane falls in a very thoroughbred category. It is very much a boom and zoomer. You are basically not going to win any turn fights or any, any fights that involve maneuvering, uh, or at least maneuverability. The P-47 is just not one of those planes. And on top of that, it bucks the trend of these German planes being good at climbing well, kind of with the exception of the Focke Wolf 190s, they're not so great, but they're better than this thing. And that's my main point about the P47. It's not a climber. So, what do you need to do? In all of these prop planes that are fairly heavy, require altitude to perform, and have a fairly decent amount of armament, what you have to do is climb off to the side. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm basically picking the furthest base and, uh, going a little bit further, because if I'm caught out by anything, let alone another P-47, if, if someone's above me, then that is pretty much a bad thing, because they have the opportunity to exploit their altitude and their speed, but I can't really do the same. And you might think, well, why would you want to climb? This thing's pretty tanky, you know, it's got some good guns, just, you know, chuck a few head-ons and you'll be right. But the way you want to play is not to just get one or two kills and then get in and get out because you're not going to learn anything that way. You're not going to become a better pilot. What you need to do is take your time and play methodically. You've got to think things through and not just rush into things expecting to come out on top. War Thunder is a game that requires a fair amount of forward planning, especially at prop tier. You can't just rush in and expect a, a good result because most of the time you'll get slammed. And that's exactly the case with the P-47, more so than many other planes, because this plane just cannot rely on its turning capability, because it's got none. And it can't really rely on its speed, because it only has that speed at altitude, due to its uh, supercharger. I believe it's a supercharger, but let me know in the comment section if I'm wrong. Now, what I'm doing here, like I said, is I'm putting it into a climb, but 4,000 meters is about where you want to be at the very minimum because that is when that second, second stage supercharger or turbocharger, I can't quite remember which one it is, will kick into gear. But at the same time, there are lots of other enemies that also perform decently okay at 4,000 meters. Uh, at 6,000 meters even, you're going to outperform things like a BF-109. You're going to be faster than a BF-109 at altitude. Have a look at the distance there. About 15 kilometers out, we have a Spitfire, an I-185, a BF-109, and there was a zero in the mix there. If the zero is at the same altitude as you, you would pretty much be toast. There'd be nothing to you because the zero can pretty much keep up with you up to 600 kilometers per hour. I know, the A6M5, it is a pretty spectacular plane in a dive and maybe I should make a video on it, but I do tend to get bored of these types of planes pretty quick. Uh, I think I played like one or two games in the N1, oh, the A6M1, A7M1. Uh, and I got pretty bored, so I ended up not gathering any more footage for it. So uh, maybe I'll make it one day, but it's a pretty boring playstyle. You still need to watch out for these planes, though. They are very, very tough opponents, and it looks like they have a better climb rate over you. So you need to take that time off to the side, have some patience, and climb to the side, get some altitude. Now, if you look across to the match and see where my team is, Three of them are lawn mowing, four of them's at low altitude, two of them are climbing into the enemies, and one of them is lagging behind with the uh, Heinkel 219 already getting caught up in a little battle with a Spitfire, probably trying to chase the G5N1. 
So my team's not exactly doing what I would uh, ideally like them to be doing. And that's a really bad thing because what I'd like them to, to be doing is getting some altitude over these opponents so that they don't have to be on the back foot all the time. And unfortunately for the P47, it's one of those planes that actually requires a little bit of coordination. And so every time you play an online game, you get just about zero coordination unless you're flying in a, a mega squad and then you can have all the coordination you want. But until then, you're flying pretty much solo, you've got no friends, and uh, you'll never ever have any friends because they'll all be dead by the time you meet them. And that's exactly what will happen here. I'm just sort of weighing out my options, thinking, oh, do I really just bother with this? Do I just call it a match and just see if I can make it with one or two kills? Because a lot of the time in the P-47, and in fact in a lot of American props that require this little bit of extra effort, um, it's really really hard to get good consistent matches because your team just ends up dying and I'm sure most of you have had this type of experience. You can see the Heikel 2119 and the P47 or the P51 there uh, coming up against the Spitfire and all I have to do is now rely on the LA5 to make a critical mistake, not see me and dive in for the P51 and uh, just as I say that he starts the dive and as soon as he's below me and turns one more time he's pretty much wasted enough energy for me to get a little bit of an upper hand i have to sort of resist that urge to go and you know go for those lawn mowers but once you do that you'll end up with a bit of an investment i i would say in your altitude and your speed because once you're above your opponents once you have a speed and altitude advantage you can convert these almost interchangeably if you need speed you can put the nose up and get some altitude if you need uh if you need speed well you can just convert some of that altitude into speed by putting the plane into a dive now this spitfire here is pretty much run out of energy and is doing exactly that trying to put the plane into a dive get some speed and unfortunately for him he cops a little bit of a beating with the 50 cals it's also noted here that the Heinkel 219 is in a bit of strife because the A7 is right behind him, but a spray of the 50 cals gives the A6, uh, A6M5 Co. a fireball, which he's unlikely to put out. And now this leaves me in a little bit of a tussle with the LA5, but the LA5 thinks that uh, Heinkel 219 is a better target than me, and so it leaves me with the Spitfire, who is basically perfectly roper doped, allowing me to set another fire. And now the LA-5 is our next target. If the Heinkel 219 pitched up, then that would be perfect. And it looks like he's kind of doing that. And as a result, the LA-5 is buggering out and is now going for a vertical. I'm not really sure why you do this because you're kind of wasting your energy. You're kind of wasting your plane. Uh, and I've gone for a spray here. Now, once I've finished my spray, I'm not going to follow through because that's going to be a waste of energy. I need to make sure that I conserve my speed, conserve my altitude. And so I'm going to put the plane into a climb and this will ensure that I have enough room to get away from the LA-5. Unfortunately, the LA-5 has said, you know what, screw this, I'm just going to go for the easy target, and uh, you know what, we can deal with the consequences later. And that seems like what most of the enemy team have decided to do. The 219 goes down, and now it's just left to me to pick up the pieces. Now, the LA-5 is going to go for a quick head-on. I'm going to get some hits, and it sets a fire, which is exactly why you don't full commit to head-ons, because it's a pretty much a 50-50. If it's a 50-50, why would you take that risk when you could be paying a repair cost upwards of 20,000 silver lines? Now, I make a critical mistake here and misjudge the energy of the BF-109, and it looks like he managed to get a couple of superficial shots, including a fuel leak, but uh, it's all upwards from here because I've got an altitude advantage and I have, uh, at some point, a speed advantage. Now, you can see this BF-109 is realizing his mistake, and I managed to get the, uh, the shot onto his wing, soaring it off. And I'm going to continue from that speed. Look at my speed, 500 kilometers per hour. And I'm going to go straight on, head on with this, or sort of semi-head on with this zero. I'm going to go for some uh, spray. And once I'm done with the spray, I'm going to continue in my pattern, flying straight forward and converting that speed back into altitude. The J21 decides ripping his wings is a great idea, which is fine by me, but that would have been nice to have an extra kill. And have a look at the amount of distance that I can get away from the A6M2. This is why you can serve your speed and, and, uh, and energy. It might look like the A6M is, uh, you know, gaining on me pretty quick, but the moment he stalls out will be the moment that I manage to spin around with this uh, rope dope. And have a look, he's just run out of speed. He's realized that he can't keep up and I am now on the offensive. This sort of rope dope type tactic, it looks like he's come around for a quick one. I thought, you know what, fuck it, and I'm going to go for the head-on. 
this guy probably didn't have any 20 mils so that was a little bit more of an educated uh an educated run and now i have five kills like who would believe that if you play your cards correctly you play your energy you play altitude you can make things work and you know what if one of you on the team does that that's kind of whatever if two of you on the team do that then that's pretty impressive and if two of you do that and work together then you're pretty much unstoppable this type of thing is so unstoppable when it is performed by the people that have the patience and have the skills to do this sort of stuff and it's not that hard you just have to be patient you just can't waste your plane and you have to pick the time to strike that's all there is to it boom and zoom is so simple but everyone tends to get it wrong especially those who are not as experienced at the game and that's generally down to impatience if you are you know getting a little bit of experience or if you're grinding up the american tech tree this is a perfect example as to why this is so damn important and i stress that so much because i always see enemy players or any prop player for that matter mowing the lawn in a plane that would be so fantastic at any altitude that is about two or three thousand meters higher now in this case here we're down to a one versus one and this is uh stalin vault versus stalin vault stalin vault versus hitler bolt and because again fast forwarding i'm going to get a little bit of altitude this is going to put me in a perfect advantage there's no way that i can lose this without throwing away my plane now you can see that little dot right there just off the left wing you can see him moving out and it looks like he's not going to bother getting some altitude but you know what that's something that i would have probably done i would have tried to get some altitude and i would have tried to at least keep my speed above 270 kilometers per hour when i were to dive i would try and put the nose down pick up some speed and then try and find ways to get me to waste some energy but unfortunately the P-47 isn't going to do that, and so gives us a perfect example of how to uh, do a boom and zoom in the Hitler Bolt. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into a little bit of a dive. Hopefully this will entice the P-47 to pitch up, but if not, that's fine because he's flying in a straight line. That's an easy enough kill, but it looks like he is going for a little bit of a, uh, a little head on. So I'm going to pull off, and then we're going to pull up. We're going to present a really, really small target to the P-47, and just as he stalls out, we are going to rope it dope and do a little bit of a split S, go in underneath him, and there we go. We pretty much have the P-47D where we want him. There's nothing he can do. He's killed all his speed, and now he cannot rely on his maneuverability because he's up against another P-47. That was the easiest six kills of my bloody life. All because of patience. A little bit of patience goes a long way. And that, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's the P-47. They're all the same. The German one, it just requires a little bit more patience. So, ladies and gents, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Maybe you could use this to get a good uh, amount of silver lines to grind. Maybe you could fly this plane in a squad and do really well. Let me know in the comments section what you think. And, of course, let me know what you uh, think about Boom and Zoom and teammates in War Thunder. <laughs> thank you very much for watching. Feed the algorithm. Take care. And I'll catch you next time.